My name is Nupasha Ansari and I'm a first year planning student. Uh, this is a student led initiative uh, that emerged as a result of noticing a glaring gap in planning discourses about disability. Uh, given that this social justice issue is more spatially connected to the built environment, and given this moment in time in the midst slash aftermath of the global pandemic, we thought it was urgent for these overview conversations to take place, especially at this institution. Um, we started out as an independent study this semester with a group of students from the master's and PhD program, but soon realized there was a heavy interest in listening and so thought the speaker series would be an important first step in taking this initiative meaningfully forward. Um, this is the first of this is the second of five events that continue weekly for the rest of the semester, every Friday from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Um, some other goals for this initiative include developing teaching modules and tools on disability, um, potentially setting up a course at the Department on Disability and Planning, and implementing new research agendas here with disability in mind. Uh, with that, I would like to hand it back to my co-organizer and fellow MCT Shannon to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Michael Stein, co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability and a visiting professor at Harvard Law School since 2005. Dr. Stein is one of the world's leading experts on disability law and policy. He participated in the drafting of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, works with disabled people's organizations and NGOs around the world, actively consults with governments on their disability laws and policies, advises an array of UN bodies and national human rights institutions, and has brought landmark disability rights litigation globally. Professor Stein is the recipient of numerous awards and has contributed to over 220 publications and nine edited volumes published worldwide. Dr. Stein earned a JD from Harvard Law School, where he became the first known person with a disability to be a member of the Harvard Law Review and a PhD from Cambridge University. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'd also like to thank Professor Chris Egris, Professor of Mobility and Urban Planning and our department head uh, for the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT for facilitating today's conversation. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, I will only say a couple of words, mostly. First of all, I want to congratulate the students for organizing this, um, filling a glaring need and doing it in such a like inclusive and compelling way. I, 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 I would be um, remiss to not call out Natasha specifically. I'm sorry <laughs> to call you out, but I remember the day you came to me early last semester saying, we need this. And as is, as is like epitomizes the MIT student, she did it. So, um, and also I really want to thank all of the students who've been involved, everyone else involved, especially the faculty, um, um, uh, D D Delia and Mariana, who have been, you know, playing the, the, the necessary role as faculty conveners. Um, I won't say anything else except to kind of talk about how we're going we're gonna to try to run today, about 20 minutes from Professor Stein, then um, we'll open up for Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, and we need have until... 1.30. 1.30. Um, so without any further ado, Professor, well, thank you for this. Um, and it's wonderful to be here. It's my first time actually at MIT, although I've lived up the street for 18 years. Um, and, and hopefully not, not the last for the next 18 years. Um, and congratulations to all of you for coming together and doing this really wonderful initiative. Congratulations to Natasha. Thank you. I have the pleasure of, of having Natasha in my HKS class on disability law and policy. And, and she's been inspiring and also inspired. And, and I hope it continues to, to move forward. Um, and I hope that I can help support you in the future. Um, I was asked to talk about disability and international development. And by development, we mean the other side of the coin of human rights. Although for those who are roughly my age and younger, we see the two of them as inextricably linked and don't view the old days of US on one side and Russia and China on the other side and see the one type of right or the other. But when we talk about development, we, we're talking about the ways in which large financial institutions like the World Bank, the Asia Development Bank, the European Development Bank, um, and bilateral, multilateral donors, such as USAID, uh, US uh, DFID from the UK, FinAid, AusAid, um, European Union's Aid, which is the largest donor organization in the world, um, and so on. 
try to work towards alleviating poverty, increasing economic development, improving the lives of, as they call it, vulnerable or marginalized populations around the world. So to give you a sense for that, it ranges for everything from building banks in Nigeria to creating a dam in Bolivia to creating employment uh, policies in, in uh, Pacific Islands to um, HIV and AIDS awareness and, and alleviation efforts uh, in, in the Americas. It can cover all those things in different ways. Note that when we describe them, much of those actually sound very much like human rights endeavors. They're just looked at from a, from a different side of view. They're considered more of a not changing the law and changing the way that legal institutions and policies work, but rather providing the physical means by which um, societies are, are improved and increased. And the, the history of disability and development is actually one of exclusion. Um, so the idea that everyone benefits from when, you know, on the high tide, all the boats rise, and everyone benefits is a great idea, except for if you're part of the population, either the really, really poor um, or persons with disabilities who very often are disproportionately represented in the really, really poor, um, they stay at the same place. So if we don't include them, everyone else does better, which is good and, and, and laudable, um, but the equity gap, the equality difference increases, and that's not good. So in the history of, of disability and, and development, if we were to start, say, at the year 2000, we would look and see that the largest endeavor in the world were the Millennium Development Goals, which ran from, 20, from 2000 to 2015. Um, there were you know, eight goals and each of them related to disability, but not a single one had the D word in it. Um, and none of the targets and none of the indicators had the D word in it either. So try to pull your hair if you like. Um, at that time, they said that uh, of the persons who were living below the dollar a day level of, of global poverty, 20% um, were individuals with disabilities and yet disability didn't appear in any of the program kind of an oversight, right? Um, they said that children in the K to 12 range, as we would put it, who were not in school numbered 70 million around the world, and that one third of those were children with disabilities, but the D word did not appear there. Um, HIV AIDS is another issue where people with disabilities thought to be asexual or uninterested, also excluded from it, and yet the empirical data suggests that the population participation is of a level. Um, and should have been there. Um, and so the, the UN was going about doing, dis, doing development work without including people with disabilities. And they were cautioned at the time. So a Nobel Prize winner, Amartya Sen, up the, up the street. Um, then president of the World Bank, James Wolfenson, may he rest in peace, wonderful man, actually made public statements that the MDGs will fail unless we include people with disabilities. Well, the MDGs did fail. Um, they did not fail solely because people with disabilities weren't included. There was a 2008 financial turn that, that the globe experienced, precipitated by lending and other very bad practices here in, in the US and elsewhere. Um, but the MDGs didn't work. Their successors, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are part of the UN's 2030 agenda running from 2015 to 2030, are a very different story. Disability is featured, you know, 17 times, both seven particular mentions, especially uh, SDG 4, which is about education. And they're also included among vulnerable populations and other parts of, of the SDGs. So just giving you a big overview from UN programming, what we've seen is this shift from total exclusion, not looking at it. And if you speak to economists, they'll tell you the old phrase, you're not counted unless you are counted. So unless we have the data about you, unless we include you, you're not there, to a world in which disability is expected to be included. Although again, it's not as complete and as inclusive as we might like. It would be nice if vulnerable populations were spelled out across the board. It would be nice if we had more disaggregation of data, disaggregation of identity statuses, but disability is considered part and expected to be part of, of the programming. And there's this whole world going on at the moment of data collection and, and data entrepreneurship that, that we can discuss. To put this into a, into a different context, 
Um, let's point a finger at USAID, US Agency for International Development, um, because it's always better to be, uh, to be polite and point to oneself and one's own country rather than point the finger abroad. So in 1997, USAID came out with a white paper policy that said, we're going to include disability in our development endeavors. When we give money to build dams in, in Botswana, when we have employment programs here, when we have um, clean water and sanitation programs in, in Nigeria and so on. Um, but it's not an enforceable policy. So here you are in the US where you know, the Rehabilitation Act was passed in 1973, 74, um, and it states that any recipient of federal money cannot discriminate, i.e. exclude, persons with disabilities. And yet the US State Department has always taken the position that the Rehabilitation Act and other civil rights acts are not extraterritorial. They don't necessarily apply outside the physical boundaries of the United States. Many international law experts, including myself, think that that's wrong. <clears throat> on a, and on a political or moral basis, we also think that it's obnoxious. If disability inclusion is such a great idea that we do for our own citizens, why on earth would we not want to do it for the rest of the citizens of the world that we're trying to help? Um, and you know, if we're looking at it from an international relations perspective, um, being a good global partner and part of a society means that you share good practices, you share good endeavors, and you support others the way that you would want your own citizens supported. Americans with Disabilities Act 1990, again, it's not recipients of federal money, although some of the entities that are covered are recipients of federal money, but the idea of non-discrimination. And then in 2004, Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa, who was one of the co-sponsors of the ADA and probably the best uh, disability supporter that, that we've ever had uh, at the US Senate, issued a, a decree to basically a senatorial decree attached with funding um, to USAID and said, you know, you need to become disability inclusive. This is ridiculous. We do it for our own citizens. We do it because we say it's the right thing to do. Why aren't we doing the right thing outside our, our boundaries? Um, and I was with them at the Library of Congress on the day that they released it and did the announcement. Well, we're in 2022 right now. Um, USAID has yet to make disability inclusion a mandate. We have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Persons with Disabilities, whose negotiations I participated in and which I have implemented in 40 something countries. Uh, we haven't done that, which would bind us to do it. Um, and USAID is now reviewing their disability policy, reviewing. Um, and they've taken comments from the outside, including from experts like myself. We've had to post them in public. Um, the person who is leading USAID's Disability sector is a very old friend and is very much in favor of pushing it, but it's a bureaucracy um, and it's entrenched. Um, and if you read about the sociology of large corporate institutions, whether USAID or the World Bank or another, um, they're very slow to change unless there is a mandate, a mandatory one. Um, so I've given them comments and of course it's been, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, because they knew exactly what I was gonna say. Um, and they're trying to use that of leverage on the inside. But in 2022, USAID is still at about, you know, maybe two and a half percent disability inclusive. So, you know, those $50 million that go to the Congo to up their education system does not have to include children with disabilities. There is within the RFPs, right, the, the call for proposals and scoring sheets, numbers where, you know, you can check disability inclusion, um, do the absolute minimum things such as get window dressing, local DPO, disabled persons organization that will enforce a module or a pilot project. This is all window dressing. Um, and you get little tick points for it. You can put in for reasonable accommodation funds in order to support some of this work, but there's not the mandatory inclusion of it. Um, and if you really wanna get techno geek with me, um, if you look at the foreign service indicators, which is, how you apprise grants and their implementation, um, you'll see that you know, some of them are the inclusion of persons with disabilities, some have to do with civil society groups, et cetera. But a $50 million grant that goes out to the Congo is going to go to one, possibly a second 
large international development firm that exists down outside the DC belt. So it's going to be Carmonix or it's going to be Learning USA because they're the only ones who could handle $50 million and its implementation. So do they really care about including a disability module? No. Do they include it? No. Um, the USAID also has a encouraged internal training session on disability. And I've given some of those training sessions and usually it's myself, the person who's organizing it and maybe two people. And so I've stopped doing those because I don't find them very useful. Um, and let me put it even more concretely with two classic stories. Um, one is USAID goes down to Jamaica to work targeting, right? Targeting to work with the deaf community. And they bring an ASL translator, American Sign Language. Only one problem. <laughs> right. ASL and Jamaican Sign Language are not the same. Right? It's, not, it's not the cool thing of Braille where no matter what language you speak, otherwise you can all read in Braille and communicate with each other. It's not a universal translator. It's not Ladino. It's not you know, Esperanto. It's, not, it's nothing like that. Um, so they couldn't communicate. Another one, which, um, which actually agreed with me a lot, um, was USA doing an employment training program uh, in, in, the, in the West Bank. Um, and they were training and hiring tour guides uh, in Bethlehem to take tourists around the, the various holy sites. Um, and they had something like seven slots for it, plus a supervisor, plus et cetera. Um, and someone that I know, you know for a bunch of years, whose name is Hamdan, uh, who's a post-polio uh, Israeli Arab with, with, with disabilities, applied for it and they said, well, sorry, you know, you're not qualified. And he said, well, why? And they said, well, because, you know, he said, my English is, is very good. Why am I not qualified? They said, well, because, you know, you, you get around on crutches and, you know, and, the, and he said, well, yes, but I, I get around on crutches now as a private tour guide. And I never make fun of the, you know, fat, slow Americans who can't follow me up and down the stairs um, and into all these holy sites. So why am I not qualified? And he said, well, you're not qualified because you have a disability. And he, they wouldn't let him be a supervisor. They wouldn't let him be a trainer. Um, he was excluded totally. That's kind of an extreme sort of case, but it tells you what goes on on the ground. Most of the time, it's just not thinking about it, right? So most of the time, it's, it's you know, we're going to do uh, women's sexual reproductive health. Um, and so why think about women with disabilities? Because they're supposed to be asexual. It's supposed to be not an area that is of interest uh, or relation to them. And why think about outreach to the group? and so on and so forth. And I can give you numbers on, you know, the number of, of mammogram machines that are accessible, not only in, in the world, um, but also even here, you know, within, within our, our backyard. So that's been, been the thought about how disability has, has, has been historically been treated. Um, there was the, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which I've been working on pretty much full time for the last, uh, 20 something years. Um, and it has changed everything, um, not as rapidly as we would like, but in the right direction. We would like. So during the negotiations, the European Union, the largest donor organization in the world, said, you know what, we should be doing only disability inclusive development. We should be including these groups in any time that we pass around money, whether it's a donation or a loan or et cetera. Um, and they agreed to do that. And therefore, in this treaty, there is the first article of any UN human rights treaty that relates to development. Aid. It's, you know, Article 32, international cooperation. It says that anytime money is being transferred, um, anytime that technology is being shared, anytime that best practices, access to scientific information, and so on, it has to be not only inclusive of persons with disabilities, but it has to be done in consultation with them and in response to their needs. Um, this has changed things. I mentioned the EU, um, but AusAid from Australia immediately went into high gear and has changed their development practices. So now it's not the Carmonics and the large organizations that are applying for these block funding. Instead, it is persons with disabilities and the representative organizations who if they want to reach out to an academic like your professor to support them, or if they want to reach out to a large international development firm 
to be able to coordinate and get the work done, we'll do so, but the dynamic is upside down now. We start with the targeted stakeholders who figure out what support they need and they stay at the top of the pyramid rather than being the window dressing at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, other states have followed suit, DFID, even though they went through their, their uh, economic cuts, made great commitments to people with disabilities, USAID, we're still a work in progress. Um, and most of all, the best thing that we've seen has been the World Bank. So let's stop for a minute and think about the World Bank and its, and its history. Um, the World Bank, if, you, if you're old enough to recall this, during apartheid South Africa, when the UN General Assembly was sanctioning South Africa, um, the World Bank said, okay, but we're just a bank. We're just a bank. You know, I, I know the rest of the states here can't give money, but we're, we're just we're just bank and we got loan agreements. Um, well, you know what, P.S., you, you are just a bank, although you're a hell of a bank, um, but you're also a U.N. specialized agency. You are part of the U.N., whether you admit it or not. It's in their charter. Um, you are required to abide by U.N. mandates. You are required to abide by U.N. human rights treaties. And it was over a period of years where one of our LLMs, um, Became, uh, became general counsel for the World Bank that they started to push a human rights agenda in the sense of creating these safeguard protections, but they didn't include disability. So if it was a matter of race, indigenous status, uh, women, and the environment that before, any product, a project that came through the bank had to be assessed. Were they doing harm to these groups? Were they including these groups? which is not to say that that nearly $200 billion a year is doing it as well as it can do it, but there's at least a consciousness and a mandate to review things. Disability was not part of it. During the CRPD negotiations, we talked about this and the World Bank again was, you know, was not committing to it, but fortunately the representative of the World Bank at that time and at the UN was Judy Uman. So, you know, mother of the American disability rights movement, independent living movement, very, very old friend, person from Brooklyn, so she had chutzpah, actually talked about, right, how we had to include the World Bank. And then another old friend, Charlemagne Klein Schwapo, whose background is Human Rights Commissioner of South Africa, um, at one point was uh, what's Obama's point person in USAID on disability. Um, she has now taken over the World Bank, and over the last six years or so, we've all worked together, even under the shadow of the orange monster, to get the World Bank to move towards including disability in these environmental statements and have committed to. So they've got deadlines that to me are a little bit too far out there, right? It's 2030, um, which aligns with, uh, with uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Although some of the earlier ones are before that, they've got 10 commitments on including disability. What does it mean? It means that in the same way that the best thing for the Americans with Disabilities Act has not been the non-discrimination provisions, our disability related employment rate has not moved one tick, not only since ADA 1990, but since roughly 1924, um, because we do not commit to policy initiatives that get people with disabilities in the workplace. However, however, under Title II, which is very relevant to MIT, right? And under Title III, the built environment and access to goods and services, we have seen a dramatic, dramatic difference. Um, if you don't believe me, you can look at the National Council on Disability Surveys, some of which I was, uh, was on their blue ribbon panels and assessing. And just the idea that a person with a disability can go to the public library on accessible transportation, have access to alternative formats in books and other materials, um, be given support while there, can go to the movies, attend restaurants, go to the theater and so on and so forth. Not perfect, but the expectation is now that this is part of our world. Everyone should be able to go everywhere. Of course, we have lots of challenges on on other areas, um, and we're still working on this, but that expectation has changed. And so even in my lifetime growing up without an ADA, right, having to call ahead to places, because you know, there's telephones attached to the wall, that sort of thing, um, and ask them, you know, do you have handicapped access? 
and what and having people have no idea what that meant, right? Or going to a hotel, you know, is your door wider than 32 inches so I can actually use your bathroom because otherwise it's going to be a very uncomfortable kind of stay, right? Um, that has gone to the point of we expect that at least in large urban areas and in other places, public transportation is accessible, public buildings are accessible. Places of, of goods and services, if they're not directly accessible, at least use alternative means. This is what's going to carry over from the World Bank. You know, close to $200 billion a year in loans or semi loans. And each of those countries has to go through an assessment of how are you including people with disabilities? Perfect? No. Lots of gaps? Yes. But in my opinion, this is what's driving the difference um, as we move forward. But, I think I've spoken enough, Professor Chris, um, and maybe we can dialogue. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I understand that there are people on Zoom can post questions, correct? Yes. And, and you'll let us know those. Yeah. Um, I'll start with a question, but then open it up. Uh, uh, first of all, just thank you for such a comprehensive overview um, and uh, a, hu a huge number of questions, but I just wanted to start with one kind of make, bring it probably too close to home, but I was very interested in your um, point on uh, the need for data disaggregation collection. And if, if I heard you right, kind of entrepreneurship with respect to understanding the phenomenon and thus being able to find innovative ways uh, to, to confront it um, or confront the challenges of uh, universal accessibility. And I'm wondering if you could reflect a bit on that from, or, or challenge, I guess, us as academics in how we can bring our abilities to bear. So we have a, we have a new college of computing and we're mm -hmm. trying to bring computing into the relevant realms of practice, including urban planning, urban studies, urban action and design. Could you give us some thoughts on how we should be grasping this ability, broadly defined computation, to bring to bear to for, uh, push forward universal accessibility? Sure, well, if we're, if we're doing the university talk um, and we have to give a shout out to Mary Ziegler and her, and her colleagues, as well as Judy Brewers down the, down the street, right? Um, and, and others that you have really nearby and they're wonderful. Um, universities, as, as Paul Harper and I have, have written, are places that can set the example for inclusion of persons with disabilities and for increasing their prospects, right? Because we always say employment, you know, education, employment, okay, but education towards what? And employment as what? Um, and universities have, have been rather slow off the mark. Um, there are, if we're gonna talk about Australia here for America, this is Paul, um, you know, there are good practices like Australia where the eight national funded universities and the 39 total universities are all part of the scheme that have to develop disability action plans and how you make campuses, classrooms, learning, teaching, and so on accessible to inclusive of persons with disabilities. And even then I would argue, and, and Paul I think would agree, um, they don't go far enough because it's still in that compliance, pain in the rear, oh, we gotta do it kind of mode, rather than wait a second, we can actually encourage this really great cohort of individuals. Um, some of them will be great, some of them will not be, but this really great undertap population to come. The same way that universities have over the last two decades now started to think about first gen, right? And they've altered their financial structures to encourage first gen and they've decreased their legacy um, reliance and admissions. So they've done it. Um, we don't want to say too much about race-based and gender-based because the Supreme Court is about uh, to, to slaughter us all on it. Um, but over since Bakke, right, over at least 30, 40 years, we have seen an effort among many, not all, not enough, universities to try to increase diversity. So the first one is, how do you increase the number of persons with disabilities, types of disabilities, et cetera? Part of it is doing the compliance and the inclusion, and that means having a master plan on how to do it. Um, and that goes beyond the old, you know, ADA or we have that uh, easy to modify list, you know, which, which is what they're required to come up with. Easy to modify is great, 
Um, what about the difficult to modify? Um, and what about the attitudinal ideas of, you know, can blind people actually do X? Can people in wheelchairs actually do yes? And the answer is hell yes, why not, right? Um, you know, I have, I have a friend who's an African American, Arab, Muslim, blind data scientist with a PhD in physics. Physics, as in, in, in her head, she sees these things and puts them together. You know, why not? Right? Why not? So one is, one is that. Um, the other is universities are very, very slow um, to, to think about proactively making themselves accessible and, and welcoming. So I will point a finger at, at ourselves. I'm we're even wearing crimson today, so God help me. <laughs> and point my finger to ourselves. You know, why, and I can't answer this question. I can only answer it rhetorically because I'm bound by a term client privilege. Um, why would Harvard University and MIT um, defend against a lawsuit brought by the National Federation of the Blind to make the Harvard MIT MOOCs and open access education accessible. Why? I mean, the law to me is very clear. I've written on it. I'm, I'm very sure about it. Although to be fair, the US Department of Justice only released their regulations last year after only 30 something years. Um, but why would, you, why would you resist that rather than thinking about Gosh, here's a population that we should reach. Oh, and by the way, it's not just, just quote unquote, uh, those who are blind, visually impaired, et cetera. But you know what? Captioning also helps non-native English speakers. If our mandate is to educate and to reach and to uplift society, why on earth don't you want to include that? Um, why would Harvard University defend against captioning uh, lawsuit brought by you know, my friends? So again, I can't talk about it. Um, National, Feder National Association of the Deaf. I mean, what are, what are the, you know, what are the, what's the word we use now? Optics. What are the optics of Harvard doesn't like deaf people? I mean, is this the optics you want to, right? So why, why do that? And then of course, Harvard always gets it right in the end. And we have a, now a very good mandatory binding accessibility policy as far as captioning and websites, but it draws a line at a certain date, doesn't go back in time. Um, so they got it right eventually, sort of, kind of. Um, but we're also, all of us universities are still a work in progress as far as, as just basic understanding of including individuals with disabilities and also different learning styles and modalities into our classrooms. Um, why was it at Berkeley, I have fun with you, Shannon, um, disabled Disneyland, home of the disability rights movement, that the, the TAs, went on strike about eight years ago because they said the professors were not providing them with accessible materials so they could enable the students with disabilities. They had to go on strike for it. Why, right? Why is it that same place, Berkeley, disabled Disneyland, right? Um, they actually said, you know what? To heck with you, we're not captioning anything. So we're taking down all our public facing materials. Spiteful, right? Exclusive. Why, why do that? So, you know, what do we do about when we do pedagogy, right? I mean, for me, because obviously I'm, I'm, I'm in, you know, up to my years in the sector and I would have many various friends come by and, and stick their white canes in my wheels, et cetera, and do other mean things to me. Um, all my materials, I don't assign case books and I don't assign, I don't assign written materials. I do everything online in Canvas in accessible formats. Everybody has access at the same time to the same materials. No one is behind the eight ball. Um, I'd like to say that's the rule. It is the rule formally. I'd like to say it's the rule as far as what faculty do, but I hear from my students all the time about this one's class and that one's class. And why do I have to be three weeks behind? And how do I engage in a discussion about that? We can do so much better. Um, we can do so much better. And of course we can also have visibility. It was only like, two months ago, and this was after years of work, that Harvard University had on its main webpage, accessibility. Now, I, I don't say I like it because they put my horrible picture on it, but I like it because it wasn't just pain in the rear, have to make ramps, have to have toilets or grab bars. It was about welcoming people, including people, and understand that the background of that was, you know, a pulse survey, you know, 
blasted across the entire university. We care about you. We want to hear about your experiences. We want to support you, enable you, and nothing about this at all. No. But it's it's not happening. I have blind friends at Harvard who are being, you know, freshmen in their dorms who can't do laundry because they're not, there's nobody for them to report to. The data backing, sorry, I teach assistive technology here. I have for a very long time. I love this topic. I'm an advocate, but I'm also kind of a realist and I face constant struggles with trying to do things, which is there's a difference between saying, yes, we want it and we know how to actually implement it. And that's the sort of Computing, how do we report up these issues that they can be addressed? Right now, it's by force of will. I go in there and I bang on doors and I say, Why did my student who's a freshman here have to go and you know beg their classmate to help them do laundry? How how much of an extra emotional burden are you gonna place? And whose job is it to actually address this mm -hmm. becomes one of the hardest parts. And and defending against against lawsuits helps us have that discussion. It helps us to, it's not just to exclude, it's to say, okay. Let's get into the dialogue and figure out the details about who's responsible for what. It's not just to say they don't want the captions, they want some details. Sure. No, I'm, I'm not exactly against those cases. There are friends. No, I know, I know. I'm sorry. My, my quote is um, more intense than but, I uh, but, uh, No, and it, and it should be, right? I mean, it should be. It's 2022, and, you know, as one of the very few visibly disabled persons on, on faculty anywhere in my university, yeah. I'm the one that, you know, I'm the faculty advisor for the undergrads because they have nobody else. Yeah. I'm the one that the students come to and complain about. And I hear you and I agree with you. Um, but I think we are moving slowly, but in the right I, direction. I agree with progress. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to make it sound like I was not and, thinking and we're moving in a good direction. And so. I'm not an apologist for, you know, for, for the university. Um, but if we're talking about computer design, right, um, there's an issue there too, which is, you know, how much do we teach? I don't mean you're at MIT, but how much do we teach across the board, schools of design, both computer, physical, architecture, et cetera, mm -hmm. about compliance and not just compliance, but also how to create welcoming spaces. Yeah. Right? And the answer to that is not very much, just as the answer to how much do we do in medical schools about having something beyond two hours during vulnerable population day about treating disability when it's even given a variety of variation, et cetera, 20% or so of the population. From a public health point of view, if you're not serving 2% or 3% of the population, up goes the red flag and the alarm bells. Mm -hmm. So where's the red flag and the alarm bells, right? Yeah, so I agree. I'm um, Forgive my excitement. <laughs> Forgive your excitement. I encourage your excitement. Okay, thank thank you. your excitement. <laughs> my, my graduate student intern from Harvard is sitting right up there, and I think would love to have a conversation at some point. So we'll talk. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Can I ask a question? Please. Yeah. First of, first of all, thank you so much for the question. You know, I have a privilege to talk with the assistant director of digital accessibility service of Harvard. And uh, after this case, they set up the, a team directly to work for those students and also work for outside the university, you know, have the improvement as well. But they do, do change a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I definitely think there's some progress, but we need time to make it up. And, and I'm so glad when we talk about digital accessibility because I'm very curious about one thing. Uh, you also mentioned a lot about ADA. I'm thinking the question is that under the pandemic, um, as we all know, digital accessibility is more and more important like globally all over the world uh, for people with disabilities. However, current law and statutes such as USADA, Title III, II, and Title III have a weak definition to replace, not only US, but also many places. Um, so, which sometimes render digital accessibility to be hard to make more progress. Um, so, not to mention globally, so I wonder, like, what would be a good solution for current statutes of the advance and solve this problem, and how to help the world to really, re like, realize this problem? Okay, yeah. that's that's a great question, and people who actually want to see really interesting, nuanced, and defined data about digital accessibility around the world, including the eighty percent that's the developing world, um, can go and look at the DARE index, D A R E just published by the UN G3 ICT, which actually does that every few years. And it's very nuanced, right? So there are 
you know, there are parts of Colombia that are more wired than say, you know, outside of Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> Um, and it's not uniform in any way. But the answer to, to you, Jingwei, is actually a pretty simple one. And that is, you know, just down the street, we have, you know, our, our good friend, Judy Brewer, who runs the World Wide Web Initiative, and they have the WCAG 2 guidelines. They're, you know, they're fairly simple to implement. They're fairly straightforward. They are not subject to really cultural differences and, and difficulties. Um, and there have been many places that have said, you know what, let's use the, the WCAG 2 or even the 1 as the standard for it. Um, and in the U.S. Department of Justice's guidelines, quote unquote, that took them 30 something years to pass, they basically say, oh, by the way, we're not telling you exactly how to do accessibility, but you would find that this WCAG 2 thing actually <laughs> covers it. So it's sort of, it was a good thing after 30 years, way too late. It was also a little bit of a comp out, but at least we have something there. Natasha. Um, you have been responsible for creating a disability focus at the Kennedy School and institutionalized a regularly offered class. Um, could you talk a bit about your journey with that, your successes and challenges? Oh, in a way that will, that will not get me into trouble. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, I came back to, to Harvard in, in December of 2003. I still had a chair, tenure chair elsewhere, um, but I was on grants and other things and, and so on. And, and I've never left and, and you know, won't get rid of me. Um, and early on, I went to uh, speak to my next door neighbor um, who was the vice dean at the Kennedy School. Um, and I said, you know, what can we do to encourage HKS to have more or have something on disability? Um, and he said, oh, um, you know Ron Cass over at BU Law School, the dean? I said, yeah, I know Ron. He said, I'm sure they'd love to have a course there. This is called NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. And I said, I'm sure they would. Um, but what, and I'm not asking to teach here, but what is it that can be done to encourage something, awareness, inclusion, something here? And he said, you know, Ron Cass, that's, that's done. Um, that was in 2004. That was the last time I, I talked to Fred Schauer, now a you know, real big shock, big academic name. Um, years later, supported by uh, HKS grads, um, I went and had a chat with Michael Ignatieff. Uh, who is in a similar position and is allegedly a human rights advocate. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and I said, you know, what can we do to have disability? And he said, well, why would that be important to HKS? Not in a mean way, but in an open way. And I said, well, if disability related funding and costs are the largest US government expenditure, um, they also tend to be among the highest government expenditures for OECD and other Western uh, countries and, and some others. Um, and it's, you know, almost 20% of, of the U.S. population. Um, and it's a cross-cutting issue. And it really makes for interesting policy analysis, as, as I hope those who take the disability law and policy class at HKS agree. Uh, you know, I hope it makes for interesting policy analysis. Um, shouldn't we be doing that? And he said, well, you know, but, you know, but we, we've, there, there are more women than disabled persons. I said, yes, there are group overlaps. He said, in that case, we'd have to actually have courses on women and policy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh my word. Um, and I said, yes. And he said, well, um, he said, let's discuss it over the summer. Um, and then I, I somehow my multiple emails and telephone calls managed not to be answered. And then he went off and killed the Liberal Party in Canada, went on to other greater things um, as well. Um, I started teaching at, at HKS with my, with my very dear, wonderful friend, uh, Charlie Clemens, um, who was, was heading up the car center, um, who was a Vietnam that protester, Quaker who helped form the, you know, the, the universal mission, one of the creators of Physicians for Human Rights, um, 
and, and other things shared in the, in the Nobel Prize for the Landmine Commission. Just a wonderful, wonderful human being. Um, and he was just outraged that there was nothing on disability. Um, so he said, you know, we approached HKS and said, can we teach, can, can we teach disability? And you've got the global expert and not to put too big a spin on it. And he said, well, you know, no, uh, not, not of interest. Um, he said, okay, well, how about if we jointly teach social movements, human rights and social movements? Because uh, Charlie had been involved in the FDA releasing HIV drugs and Pueblo Indians land battles and other things. Um, and so he and I taught human rights and social movements for a bunch of years together, which was a great privilege. He's a beautiful, beautiful human being. Um, and then he retired and HKS said, well, would you like to continue the course? And I said, thanks, no, I'd like to teach what I'm known for. Um, and no offense, but I'll put my reputation in this area against anyone else on your faculty in their area. And it doesn't make sense to me why I should be teaching. Um, and they said, okay. Um, and so I've been teaching that since. Um, HKS is an interesting place. Um, about five or six years ago, one of my students who came to HKS to, to study with me, and others, of course, but with me, um, put together a disability justice caucus. Um, we helped to fund it. Um, they, they've remained in, in business as it were since. Um, but, you know, they also held their, their meeting on, on Wednesday as a open house um, and didn't bother and bother me. So, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting kind of dynamic. And frankly, it's, you know, it's reflected, you know, in, in many other parts of, of Harvard University, you know, as in, you know, we've got now a disabled law students association who are often running on their own. Um, and I rarely hear from them, which is both good and not so good. Not so good because I can support them in ways and I'd be happy to do that. Really good in that it's, it's their years at law school and their student lives. Um, and they've taken hold of it and ownership of it. Um, and that's really good. That's really good. And it's really good that if there's a disability event, they don't have to have stop. Mm -hmm. That's good, it's as, as it should be. Um, but it's a, it's a work in progress across the university. We have, a, a, we have an affinity group at the medical school that focuses mostly on, on mental disability. Um, Pugsy, the graduate school has always had a, a head chapter, Association of Higher Education and Development. Um, although again, these things over time go through different different metamorphoses. So, you know, Hugsey, for many years, I used to do two lectures a year with them, um, you know, and, and I received their award for blah, blah, blah. Um, now I don't hear from them, <laughs> other than having one of the students come to class. Um, you know, I don't, I don't hear from them. So it's, it's, it's always very interesting with, with students everywhere. And I'm sure you have your perspectives too, right? You get, you get wonderful kids who come by and, you know, I want to do this, I want to do this. And you say, wonderful, come and do it. And then you never hear from them again. Um, and then you get wonderful students who tell you that. And then you, you're with them all the way through school and then afterwards, and then they come back and, and you continue your relationship. And then new ones pop in and discover that they really like this area. Um, and it's where they want to spend a lot of time and focus on. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to, to generalize among a very large, diverse, interesting, talented population. But you know, the bottom line is I could say that, that I feel really like my students. So that's, that's always a good thing. Um, Are there any questions from the- Yes, we do have a question on Zoom. Um, this is from Alex Chen, who works at the Poverty Action Lab at MIT. Um, Alex's question, uh, well, first, uh, they thank you very much for speaking to us and for all your meaningful contributions. Um, Alex is wondering if you have any recommendations for how policy organizations that fund international development research can increase disability inclusion efforts in engaging with researchers and PIs and the partners and donors. And specifically, Alex is wondering how you think these organizations can better include persons with disabilities in annual requests for proposals, or if there are specific educational resources or methods that you would recommend in training staff at these organizations. Great, wonderful. Um, there is no end of... of um toolkits and workbooks on inclusive international development. Um, you know, one or two I've done, but, but there's lots and lots, including great open access resources at the World Bank for how to do the inclusion 
right? The short answer to it is you begin by reaching out to representative organizations, ensuring that the representative and asking them if you could be of use, going with humility, not with imperialism, um, and finding out what their priorities are, and then trying to sculpt or work the project around them. Um, but the, the longer one is, you know, we're sort of enculturated now um, where we go into a room visually, virtually, physically, or whatever. Um, and if we look around and we don't see a certain variety, it's never perfect. And inclusion is never perfect. And so it's a challenge. We all fail. Um, but it's a process. If we don't see a person of color in the room, then hopefully something, you know, scratches in the back of the head and says, gosh, you know, whatever. Um, or if we don't, if we're having a discussion, we don't hear enough about a particular group, um, then you know, generally you get a little scratch. Um, that's keeping that in mind as in, here's a project on, on education in Malawi. Um, and does it say anything about how kids with disabilities get there or what happens when they're in the classroom? If there's nothing there, um, then there's not likely to be there. So doing the reverse, which was also Alex's question, and crafting RFPs, um, not only emphasizing that inclusion of marginalized populations, not otherwise you know, represented, et cetera, um, should specifically list people with disabilities, um, including, and this is a good USA practice now, um, including the idea that DPOs, disabled persons organizations, and otherwise should be you know, front and center and included in these proposals that um, maybe even setting aside a percentage of the budget for reasonable accommodations. I mean, they're, they're very well established known practices, but it comes down to, you know, to humility and to openness. So we have, we have a project that we hope will be funded um, that we, you know, we work pro bono, so we don't take money from it. Um, that we hope will be, funded in Ecuador uh, on behalf of various disability groups and climate justice um, and has to do with uh, sustainable jobs, et cetera. Um, we reached out to the group because, you know, I know them having worked in Ecuador, et cetera, um, and worked with them and said, what do you think about this? Is this something that might be of interest, right? Because it goes through the mission. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm not, hey, here's money, um, we're gonna come and take the money and control it, but rather, is this something that you wanna do? Is this something of interest to you? Um, and if so, let's, let's talk about it and figure out how you're the ones who receive the money and we're here to support you if you want it um, and help you think through it and help you and do that. So turning around, the, turning around the hierarchy is also really important and a challenge. Can I ask a challenge question for that? Great, please. Um, I like you, you're good. Oh, <laughs> we, we, we have conversations to have. We have, I'm not gonna dump them all at once, but so NGOs, um, nonprofits that are meant to help people with disabilities often end up infantilizing and protecting and how does one evaluate the NGOs that are incentivized mostly to keep themselves fed, not mm -hmm. to actually serve, because mm -hmm. we don't have proper metrics on whether or not they're serving. Mm -hmm. And and this is because I, I also for context travel around the world and do like assistive technology development on the ground with individuals. And the, the variety of value that you get out of certain NGOs and the way that they will treat and engage is is you know, I'm sure you know there's a lot of subtlety to how you evaluate and partner with NGOs and then how that ends up trickling down to the individuals who are, you know, now you're going to the head of some unit and you're saying, here's some money, is this of interest to you? They have their own priorities in the same way that, you know, I've been told very explicitly getting me PI status at MIT is not a priority because they have bigger things to deal with. Fine, I understand, but on the ground, there's a lot of people who have very different opinions about what they would like the world to look like. So it becomes a bit tricky when you work through the nodes of the NGOs to actually affect individuals. I think 
at least for me. And I was just wondering if you've experienced anything like that and found ways to navigate it. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and by the way, accessible technology in the developing world, Stein and Lazar, OUP. Trying to say, Stein and Lazar, OUP 2021. You may like that as well. Okay. Um, and then we can have <laughs> discussions. Thank you. Yeah, discussions about it. Um, the short answer is that nearly all DPOs are NGOs. Nearly no NGOs are DPOs. Um, and so we always, and, and those of us in the disability rights movement, always focus on the DPOs, not on the NGOs. Can, can you help us understand more of the distinction? Because I think I have... So DPOs are organizations created by persons with disabilities for persons with disabilities. NGOs like Amnesty International, which still doesn't have a disability policy, still does not have it. Um, they tried to write one because my friend Janet is now the chair in, in, in disability rights advocate right here in the US. Um, and, you know, and, and when they asked, for comments, I basically shredded them um, on things like, what do you mean disability is too complex? Women are all univocal, they're all the same. <laughs> what do you mean? You know, what do you mean? Um, are you really saying this in 20, whatever the year was, 2020? Um, Only behind closed doors. Right, so, you know, amnesty does not have as on its agenda to empower people with disabilities. Um, and if they happen to stumble upon something that helps people with disabilities, they're not averse to it, but that's not where they're going. Um, is, it, is a DPO a, a legal distinction or is it, how do you, how do you vet and understand? It's by people with disabilities for people with disabilities. So it's not even the large service provision things like Handicap International, which is now Humanity and Inclusion, or Christophilus Blindis Mission, CBM. Um, which is now doing lots of disability empowerment. It means it's things like action on disability and development in Bangladesh. It means it's, you know, the organizations that begin with sweat equity and people with disabilities coming together and working with each other and care about doing the job for people with disabilities. The NGOs, you know, your point is, is extraordinarily well taken, right? You have to, they're, they're not there to work for people with disabilities. Human Rights Watch, I've got lots of friends and I do trainings for Human Rights Watch, um, did not do any disability work until, until the CRPD was passed. And then Arya Nair said to George Soros, okay, give them some money and they'll create a disability division, which is now headed by my former intern. So $12 million made that, made that happen a couple of years ago. Um, Amnesty used to go into the, into the psychiatric hospitals. And on one side, you'd have the political prisoners. On the other side, you'd have people with psychosocial disabilities. And they were both held in the same conditions, right? Restraints, electroshock therapy, you know, isolation, et cetera. And Amnesty would report on the political prisoners, which is good, and totally ignore the ones on this side. Um, and that's why Nair and Soros then created Human Rights Watch or looked into disability, and then they created OSI which focused on that, that population when we created OSI. Um, and, it's a, and it's a huge problem. You're exactly right. It's a huge problem. And I'll, and I'll even give you nuance to your problem. There are, there are groups that claim to be DPOs, right? right? Um, that basically exist in order to serve themselves and or act as a conduit for various governments to the disability sector as service providers and in doing so serve themselves. So NAFOD in Bangladesh, um, the, the national group in Vietnam, um, even, this, even the CDPF in China, right? Are made up primarily of non-disabled people on salaries from the government charged to speak for people with disabilities and, you know, and those organizations, especially CDPF, which is a very large animal, tend to have nuance in them because there are some amazingly good disability rights advocates with and without disabilities within them. But by and large, that's not what they're, what they're really doing. And they're a, they're a problem. So that's the power of policy. That's, that, I mean, I'm an engineer. I can, I can write code. I can build you an, an international database. I'm working on giant auditing processes. 
I can't get the policy changes in place that empower the money to trickle down to the right places because I'm watching the, the money flow down into organizations like that before it ever reaches, you know, the tiniest little fraction to the bottom. Right. And if you want to add even more nuance or depression to, to things, <laughs> um, there is an addition in the DPO community, just as there is in the international NGO community, a problem of elitism and celebrity. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. elitism mm -hmm. in that you know, if you want to get X group, if you want a group that's going to be working in Niger, then you go towards this group because everyone knows that's who does it, mm -hmm. and everyone knows within the group that this is the individual to invite. Whereas the really, really interesting, innovative, iconoclastic work mm -hmm. is being done with sweat equity by the groups themselves, which, by the way, also include parents and siblings and other so, allies and, and supporters. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a problem. And then celebrity, right? We, I could tell you, if you're going to invite someone from Africa or, or whatever, give me a country, and I could tell you who is the person who's most well-known there and who's going to get invited to, to stuff. And by the way, it's here too, right? Yeah. So when the Massachusetts legislature wanted to talk about supported decision-making, Right. They called up Chris Griffin, who was then the head of the Disability Law Center. They called me and they said, will you come and testify for us? And we said, no way. You get the people with intellectual disabilities whose lives are on the line to come and talk to you. And then maybe afterwards, we'll give you some opinions and, and support it. But no way are we going and talking on their behalf. Mm -hmm. right. but, but Chris is, you know, wonderful, and incredible. And, and, you know, I wish I could help. Um, that's a problem. A lot of people show up, especially if there's if there's money attached. They're trying to build a tree. So I just wanted to hold for a second, yes. check in on um our timing, because I understand we're supposed to end at 1:30. Mm -hmm. I don't want to cut off the conversation, but I also want to recognize that others might have places oh, to please. go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been for years. Don't worry. <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> but I don't also want to exclude. Are there any other questions on the Zoom that we? Um, yes, we we did. We have someone who'd like to make a comment. Um, she's actually part of the Disability Justice Caucus and ran the event on Wednesday. Um, so Priscilla would like to make a comment. Hi there, um, everyone. Hi there, can I be heard? I just wanna check that I'm being yeah. picked up. Hi there, so my name is Priscilla Mensa and um, I'm the one of the co-chairs of the, the DJC. And um, I just wanted to um, respond, Professor Stein, to your comments just because the last thing that the DJC would want would be the impression that we somehow um, neglected to invite you. And that's something that we regret. Um, I think it's really important to probably highlight at this point that there's a really disparate culture around disability at HKS. And so I can't pretend to, um, I can't say that I knew of the faculty or professors at the Harvard Kennedy School upon arriving as a blind student. Um, who were active in this space and were still doing that work. And so the last thing we want to do is to give the impression that somehow we're not willing to work with academics who have been doing the work for a long time. And Professor Stein, we recognize that. And, you know, I regret that um, a personal invite did not go out to you. Um, I think that there's work for us to probably do to try and make sure that we're reaching out to all uh, academics who are not only disabled, but are allies and keen to work in this space, but that's work we have to do. And right now as disabled students, we're just trying to actually get, you know, together. And that's been extremely hard work. And so just mm -hmm. to say, and to hold space for that, because the last thing I'd want to do is to give the impression this was some sort of personal slight. So thank you for holding space for that. It's not a personal slight. I am, I am of service to all the students across the university and to a whole bunch of them at MIT and BU and BC <laughs> and other places as well. And I'm always happy to support you, but um, might not have been the, the most optimal way of moving forward. Um, um, yeah, but I, I'll respect all those times. Well, perhaps if you're willing to stay, I'm sure there's many people who would like to engage you a bit more. But I'd be happy to, as long as you get me outdoors in eight minutes. Eight minutes. Oh, so <laughs> maybe some people can accompany you out the door to engage that way. 
I just want to thank again the organizers, especially when I thank you, Professor Stein, everyone who participated, all the questions. What a great conversation. And thank you for making us making it much more clear what we all the work we have to do within just our own academic unit within this large institution. So I'm thank you for supporting us here. Yeah, no, I, we will hopefully be able to, you know, ride the momentum that's being generated. So thank you so much. Um, I don't want Thank you. 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 Thank you.